Okay, hello and welcome to the Internal Medicine Series for Clinical Clerkships. Today we'll be discussing acid-base disorders, specifically the urine anion gap. Okay, so just a quick review about the major causes of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So when we're talking about a urine anion gap, it's usually in the setting of a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So for the most part, these are the four major causes, the major subgroup causes of a NAGMA, right? GI tract problems, okay, kidneys, drugs, and fluids. So let's talk about each one really briefly. So GI tract, if you're having diarrhea, kidneys, if you have a renal tubular acidosis, drugs such as acetazolamide, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, right, and fluids, if you're, if you're receiving excess NACL, all of these, by the mechanisms discussed in the previous video, would likely cause a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis with the um, primary central hallmark being this and an exchange protein, which allows for the, the maintenance of a normal anion gap despite there being low bicarb or a metabolic acidosis. So the concept of a urine anion gap will be explained on this slide. So for the most part, this is what happens normally, okay? So urine anion gap is essentially calculated as the urine sodium plus the urine potassium subtracting the urine chloride. And normally, this is either just barely positive or zero, okay? So what is exa exactly does a urine anion gap mean, right? So if we're looking at Na and K, this basically corresponds to the unmeasured, okay, unmeasured anions, right? Because their presence signifies that there are unmeasured anions in the urine, which means that for the chloride, chloride anion, really signifies the presence of unmeasured cations. And most importantly, in the urine, when we're talking about unmeasured cations, it's usually in the setting of NH4 plus ammonium, okay? So as you can expect, in a normal scenario, a person will be having, um, you know, for the most part, unmeasured anions equal to the number of unmeasured cations in their urine. So they're gonna have a normal an urine anion gap of close to zero or positive. All right. Okay, and why is this important to discuss? So as you can see here, for the most part, unmeasured anions in the urine are not going to be changed, right? What's really the driving factor for determining whether a urine anion gap is positive or negative is really the magnitude of this chloride anion here. So let's talk about a case where you might have a urine anion gap that is very positive. So what does it mean if you have a urine anion gap that's positive? Essentially, it means that, let's say that the Na, okay, plus the K in the urine, right, this stays constant. This doesn't change very much. But let's say that for some reason the Cl, all right, in the urine is very low. And as you can see here, if this is the case, you're going to get a very positive urine anion gap. And what this suggests to us is that because Cl is low in the urine, that suggests, okay, that ammonium is low in the urine, aka for some reason the kidney is unable to excrete protons, all right, and that will eventually lead to a positive anion gap, all right. Let's talk, let's discuss a case where the urine anion gap is very negative, okay. So once again, Na plus K, okay, remember these are the Unmeasured, these signify the unmeasured anions, okay? I know they're cations, but they signify the unmeasured anions. They don't change much, okay? And minus Cl, and let's say that in this case, a Cl is very increased, okay? Now you can imagine that if this happens, you'll have a very negative urine anion gap, okay? And let's think about it. So once again, Cl, for this time, it, the magnitude is increased drastically, right? And that suggests the presence of acid, right, being excreted massively in the urine. So for some reason, the body is trying to, you know, compensate for some kind of metabolic disorder by excreting acid massively. Okay, so we've just discussed the two mechanisms by which a urine anion gap can be positive or negative, but how does this really relate clinically, right? So for the most part, you order a urine anion gap in the setting of someone who has a, a NAGMA, but you're unsure whether the source is, is GI, gastrointestinal, or renal, okay, and this is very important, um, and the urine anion gap will come into play here to differentiate between the GI and the renal cause of a NAGMA, all right? 
So in terms of a renal NAGMA, we're really going to be talking about RTA, okay, renal tubular acidosis. And for, for the GI sources of um, NAGMA, you know, things like diarrhea, okay, uh, you can also have fistula and also ostomies, okay, F, okay, O, I'm just not going to write them out. Um, so these are the primary causes, but in both of these cases, you're going to have a preserved anion gap, okay? So this is preserved. It's not increased and it's not decreased. Um, however, you know, your bicarb is going to be low, thus a metabolic acidosis. All right. So how does a urine anion gap help you to differentiate this? So let's remind ourselves again, what does a urine anion gap tell us? So the urine anion gap tells us that the UHE is equal to, all right, the urine sodium, okay, plus the urine potassium, all right, minus the urine chloride. We mentioned how important this urine chloride is, right? So we're going to be primarily focusing on this right here. So in the setting of a renal tubular acidosis, the way I like to think about it is, uh, you know, for the most part, the body is, for some reason, the, the, the kidneys are holding onto this excess acid. Okay, so it's really a, a dysfunction of the kidney. The kidneys are retaining acid, thus causing a acidosis, and it's called a renal tubular acidosis because the renal tubules are unable to excrete acid. Okay, or unable to absorb, reabsorb bicarb for the most part. So if you're thinking about it like that, okay, remember what we talked about in CL. CL in the urine basically corresponds to NH4 plus, okay, or proton in the in the urine. And in a RTA, in a renal tubular acidosis, you're unable to excrete this. So you would expect the chloride is decreased and the anion gap is positive, okay? So let's say that you have a patient who basically has NAGMA on the serum chemistries, okay? Um, and you're not sure if it's a GI or a renal source. If you do a urine anion gap and it comes back positive, very positive, that is suggestive that this patient has a urine anion gap that's positive um, and, and a NAGMA uh, secondary to a RTA, okay? Now let's talk about the case of a patient who is perhaps, you know, um, having a NAGMA because of a GI source. So if it's because of a GI source, let's think about what happens, okay? So what happens when you're actually having diarrhea? In diarrhea or ostomies or fistulas, you're losing bicarb massively, okay, in the stool. So your body is having a metabolic acidosis, okay? Um, so you have a metabolic acidosis. However, uh, for, for all of the bicarb that's lost, chloride is also being uh, reabsorbed um, intraluminally within the intestines and the colon. Uh, so your anion gap, once again, is preserved, okay? However, you still have a metabolic acidosis. That being said, how can the urine anion gap help to determine that this is a magma secondary to the GI source? So once again, let us review, okay? UAG is equal to sodium plus the potassium, the urine, minus the chloride, okay? So let's think about what happens um, when you're having, for instance, a diarrhea, you're losing the bicarb, okay? So in this case, there's nothing wrong with the kidneys. We need to remember that. In the GI source, we're assuming that the kidneys are functioning normally, okay? And if that's the case, if you're massively losing bicarb, then you would expect that the kidneys would be holding on to bicarb, okay? Or another term for holding on to bicarb is excreting acid. And in that case, you would expect that the NH4, okay, and the urine would be high, all right, because basically what happens is ammoniogenesis is increased. Ammoniogenesis, you really want to think about that um, occurring in the proximal tubular cells of the kidney uh, as a primary marker that for every proton that's excreted, okay, for every proton that's excreted into the lumen of the proximal convoluted tubules, a bicarb is able to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. All right, so in a case of a patient who is massively losing bicarb, you would expect that the kidneys, which are healthy, okay, it's massively letting go of protons, in the, in, in, protons and ammonium, okay, in order to regain that bicarb. So in this case, you would expect that the urine chloride would be very high because the urine ammonium is high, okay, and thus this urine anion gap would be very negative. Okay, and this is how you can differentiate between um, whether a NAGMA is due to a GI or a renal source. Okay, so now that we've gone over the, the primary causes of um, urine anion gap being positive versus negative, let's go over this USMOE style question. Um, so take a moment to read it, okay? And after reading it, we will, um, we will go over it together. So 
basically what's happening here is that this is a 33-year-old female, okay, without any medical history, presents for a one-month duration of these joint pains and also um, systemic symptoms of intermittent fevers that come and go, okay? She also notes that she has been having uh, two days of watery diarrhea. We're not sure if that's significant or not. Physical exam doesn't tell us anything, um, but the, uh, the physician decides to order a serum and also urine chemistry, and now we're asked what is the cause of her presentation. So the first things first, we see the serum chemistry, and whenever I see a sodium, a chloride, and a, also a bicarb, the first thing I do, almost like a reflex, is calculate the anion gap, right? So you want to do 136 minus 110 minus 14, and you get 12, and that's normal. Okay, however, we know that the bicarb is low, so this is definitely a anion, anion or actually this is a metabolic acidosis, right, with a normal anion gap, right, so it's NAGMA. Um, so this physician clearly had a lot of foresight, right, because he, he knows that, oh, maybe it was a NAGMA, so he somehow, you know, decided to order urine chemistries before he even knew what the um, NAGMA existed, okay, so he ordered the urine chemistries, and we see that, uh, let's see what's happening here, so we calculate the urine anion gap, right, we will eventually get um, 102 plus 33, that's 135, so this is equal to 29. And we see that this is very elevated, right? So remember when we talked about in the previous slide, okay, let's go back here. So in the previous slide, okay, so urine anion gap is Na plus K minus Cl in the urine, okay? And the way that the urine anion gap can be positive is if the chloride is somehow negative, right? And negative chloride signifies that the protons, okay, or the ammonium in the urine is low. So that's because of a renal tubular acidosis, so this is the problem right here. So if I've already given away the answer for the most part, the answer is B. This is a renal tubular acidosis, okay? Um, so, you know, this, this two-day history of watery diarrhea is somewhat of a red herring here, especially in the setting of intermittent fevers, right? Some of you guys might be thinking, oh, maybe this person has HIV or something like that. Um, unfortunately, none of the causes of diarrhea would explain this because in, in a real diarrhea producing a secondary nagma, we would expect that the urine anion gap would be negative, right? And the reason for that is, remember, if we go back here, we see that the urine anion gap is Na plus K minus a urine Cl, okay? In a case of someone who has massive diarrhea, right, you would expect that the chloride in the um, urine would be very high. And the reason for that is because the kidneys is compensating for this um, for this loss of bicarb, okay, and through the intestines and the colon by excreting um, protons massively so that you would expect the chloride and also the protons to be high in the urine, thus the anion gap would be negative. We come back here, we see that's not the case here, right? So A, D, and E are out. So now we're really between B and C, and obviously reactive arthritis doesn't explain, um, you know, it wouldn't have any serum chemistry abnormalities associated with it typically. So the answer here is B. So if we really go back here and dissect this question, we see that this is a 33-year-old female, basically a female of productive age, okay? Um, and, you know, it's very pathognomonic for, you know, I guess it's not, but, you know, it's associated with um, autoimmune diseases, okay? So whenever I see this on the test, 33-year-old female, I immediately think, okay, maybe there's something autoimmune going on. And this is really compounded and cemented by the idea that she's presenting with these new onset joint pains and also intermittent fevers. So immediately I start thinking lupus. Okay, so this two-day episode of watery diarrhea, if this was like a week of watery diarrhea, then I would be thinking, you know, maybe this is something uh, something else here. But this is two days, so do we know if this is significant or not? Perhaps um, perhaps not, right? In this case, it's really quite a red herring. So we see that this is a female who basically has uh, new onset joint pains and intermittent fever suggestive of lupus, okay? And we know that lupus is actually associated with type 1 renal tubular acidosis. So if you um, if you didn't get that, you can go back to my type 1 renal tubular acidosis video and watch it. It, it describes the pathophysiology of why lupus is actually associated with um, type 1 renal tubular acidosis. But, in, in, you know, just a quick review of that. So what happens in lupus is, you know, you have these autoantibodies that basically knock out the HK ATPase, creating a type 1 renal tubular acidosis. Um, and that's basically the whole thing is, is going on here is that this is a female with lupus, okay? And we're supposed to figure out that her laboratory abnormalities and recent complaints are due to a lupus flare and also the um, onset of renal tubular acidosis. So hopefully this question kind of summed up how we use uh, something like the urine anion gap to differentiate between the sources of a NAGMA.